And so I want to talk to you for the next few moments from this thought. I want to talk to you from this that I've entitled, Looks Can Be Deceiving. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, looks can be deceiving. Say, that's why I married you, because looks can be deceiving. Joking, joking. Would you, some people meant that. We'll have some confession after. Let's pray together before we start. God, thank you for this amazing Sunday that we get to celebrate together as one global church body, one global church family. We pray in every church that's gathering around this community, around the world, Lord, that the Holy Spirit reveals himself in a fresh, new way. We're praying for the salvation of the Jew and the Gentile. We're praying for the prodigals to return home. We are believing, Jesus, that in 2024, hearts will turn to you like never before. As dark as our world gets, your light promises to shine that much brighter. And we link our faith with that and welcome you to these next few moments we share together. Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Have you ever found yourself falling down what we call in our day a dark hole, where you watch a YouTube video, or you're reading an article, or you're watching some Netflix documentary, and you're looking at the time, and uh, an hour and a half has passed, you've got nothing accomplished, and you hope nobody knows what you've done, right? As I fell down this dark hole, I don't know why I'm reading this article or watching this video about socks on dogs. I don't know how it happened. And some of you know me, I'm a new dog owner, and I just, I, I find these things, I'm like, I don't know why I care about this and why I'm reading this. This happened to me the other day. I fell down a dark hole, and it happened to be about something with a woman. If you're a girl dad, any girl dads in the house, wave your hands in the air, get, clap your hands if you're a girl dad. Yes, we celebrate being a girl dad because there's some lean times, man, especially teenage days. There's some lean times. I've got three daughters. And so anytime I read something about a girl or a woman who's like making history, I'm all about it, right? I'm reading the article. I'm forwarding it to the family group chat. I'm telling my daughters about it. And I recently read an article about a woman named Florence. Florence Chadwick, to be exact. You'll see a picture of her on the screen. Florence, she was born in San Diego, California, and she is what is known as a competitive endurance swimmer. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing. I didn't know this thing existed. Um, I'm not a swimmer, full disclosure. After 10 yards of swimming, I start thrashing as though I'm being attacked. And here's the sad thing. I've taught my three daughters how to swim. So how do you think they swim? When, when I try to tread water, my wife says, stop doing that. They're going to think you're drowning. The lifeguard will jump in after you. I said, sweetheart, this is just how I swim. I'm sorry. I apologize. It doesn't meet your standards. But Florence, she's this, this endurance swimmer, and I'm not just talking about a couple laps, you know, in the public pool, a couple laps at the Y. I mean, she would swim for 10, 15, and 20 hours. She's got records as being the first woman to swim in some really neat areas. She swam across the English Channel. She swam across um, the Straits of Gibraltar. Florence was the real deal. Don't be mistaken. And as I'm reading this article, I'm reading how she's accomplishing all these great things, and now she's going to swim from the Catalina Island, off the coast of California, to the coast. And this was her next great feat, and she trains for years for this stuff, and, and specifically for this, um, this swim that she was going to do. And as she starts out leaving the island of Catalina and going to the coast of California, she's joined by a couple boats. One boat has her, her team that has trained her, and they're watching to make sure she doesn't cramp, and that she, she is safe as she gets into these frigid waters, these Pacific frigid waters. Her mother's even in the boat, because you know mom's always going to be there. Mom's always going to be there. No matter what you say, I can say I'm going to be a rocket scientist tomorrow. Mom's going to be there. Okay, let's do it, honey. You're going to be a rocket scientist. Let's do it. So mom's there in the boat, and there's another boat. Watch this. They've got riflemen in the boat to keep the sharks at bay. I can't assume I don't like sharks. I'm not doing this, all right? But Florence, she's the real deal, like I tried to tell you. And so Florence takes off, and she goes and trying to accomplish this amazing feat, be the first woman to swim from Catalina Island all the way to the California coast. And in 10, into, in 10, 10 hours into it, 12 hours into it, 15 and a half hours into this, the waters are choppy. The tide is, is beating against her. And then if you've ever taken the ferry, have you ever taken the ferry, anybody in here from, from California, Catalina Island, what happens most times? This dense fog begins to form. And as a dense fog began to form, she no longer could see where she was headed. She couldn't see the shoreline anymore. And she calls out a couple different times to the boat saying, hey, I'm done. I don't want to go any further. And so, of course, her crew and mom is saying, sweetheart, you can do it. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. 
and she did what she had never done before. You know what our girl Florence did? I'm an hour down the hole now that I'm telling you about it. I'm, I've lost an hour's worth of time. And nothing is being accomplished. She gave up. Never had done it before. She gave up. And when she gave up, they pull her back in the boat out of the Pacific Ocean. She sits on the boat, and she can now see well in the fog. She can see the shore is less than a mile away. She swam over 15 hours and gave up right before she arrived. Just before she arrived, she gave up. The next day, she was interviewed because this is a big thing in our country. A lot of people tuned in to see what was going on. And here was her quote. She said this, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. And if we do anything in here today, we're going to help you see the shore. No matter where you are in your faith journey, whether you believe or don't believe or somewhere you feel in between, we're going to help you see the shore. We're going to help you persevere. We're going to help you pursue the person of Jesus. We're going to help you fight through the fog of life. No matter where you are and what's going on in your life, I'm going to ask you today to keep swimming. If you're like me, keep thrashing. Do whatever you have to do, but keep pushing towards Jesus. And the Bible tells us the hope that we have to push towards Jesus is found in the greatest thing that's ever happened on this planet, and it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. But here's my concern. Around the world, every continent that we have in our world, everybody is gathering, celebrating a resurrection. But my question is, do you know what the resurrection is? Do you know why you should leave here and the resurrection should change your life? Chances are many of us don't. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd love you to open right now to John chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and download a Bible app. It's really easy. And as you download that Bible app, as you turn into your Bible, turn to John chapter 11. As a church, we've been in the book of John. We've been studying the I Am Statements of Jesus. And they've been in the book of John. And today we're going to go on one of the greatest I Am Statements of them all. John chapter 11, verse 1. Um, this might be new for some. For others, it might be um, some, something that you're familiar with. But I promise there's something new you're going to discover here today. This is what the resurrection truly is. Verse 1, it says this. Now a man named Lazarus. Someone say Lazarus. You know, in our modern day and age, and I, I might look young, but I'm not young. I've been married 22 years, three daughters. Um, these young kids these days, they're giving their pets people names, and they're giving their kids pet names. You know what I'm talking about? If that's you, that's okay. We're judging you. Um, but if you're looking for a name, I guarantee no one in kindergarten has Lazarus, so it's all yours. Can we get a Lazarus raised up here, right here today? Anybody pregnant? Here's a name for you. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Someone say the sisters. They're going to be important in the story. Around my house, my little daughter, she calls the older two, the sisters did it, Dad. So when I read this story, I think about the sisters. Verse 2, it tells there's, there's intimacy here. Jesus loved this family. He spent time with his family. It's interesting to think that Jesus had community. He built friends and friendships. Verse 2 says, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. She recognized he is the Messiah and worthy of glory. Verse 3 says, so the sisters, say it with me, the sisters, the sisters, they're in trouble, Dad. The sisters did it. The sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. It's beautiful how they relate the relationship with Lazarus and Jesus as the one you love. And I wonder if you relate yourself to Jesus in that way. Lord, I'm the one that you love. Verse 4 says, When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that, the Son, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. That's very important. Please keep that in mind. Verse 5 says this, Now Jesus loved Martha and the sisters and Lazarus. So when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. That's hard to reconcile. He's on his deathbed. He's going to give up at any moment. He's about to code, as they say in the movies, right? And Jesus says, okay, not leaving. Okay, a lot of suffering going on. Keep suffering. A lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of tears. Yeah, feel all the feelings. Stay in that place. I don't know how we reconcile verses 5 and 6. So go, go down with me out of verse 17. It says this, 
On his arrival, so now Jesus comes back. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus, watch this, guys, has already been in the tomb how many days? Not one, not two, not three, four days in the tomb. This means Jesus, he missed the funeral. He missed the funeral procession to the tomb. He missed the, the procession. It says, verse 20, look who comes out and meets him when we drop down to verse 20. It says, when Martha, one of the sisters, heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Mary's upset. Mary's going through the grief process. She's not happy that Jesus did not fulfill her expectations. Have you been there? Are you there today? There's some expectations that are still left unfulfilled. And she said, no, you're going to church on Resurrection Sunday. You're going to God. You're going to prayer. I'm staying here. And here's how Martha greets Jesus in this culture. She would have greeted him as Shalom, Rabbi, or Shalom, Messiah. She would have bowed. She would have hugged. She would have showed some kind of honor and due respect. In her moments of grief, at her worst moments, here's how she approaches Jesus. If you had been here, my brother would not have been dead. Can anybody hear the head roll in there? There, there's something in there. I'm not sure what it was in the Hebraic culture, but there's some kind of head roll. There's some kind of something letting him know it's, this is business. She's not very happy. She says, if you had been here, I wouldn't be single. I wouldn't be divorced. I wouldn't be widowed. If you had been here, finances would be better. If you had been here, I wouldn't have these traumas that I'm trying to get past. If you had been here, I'd be like so-and-so, and I'd have what they have. If you had been here, Jesus. Verse 22 she says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. You can see between verse 23 and 24, they have a misunderstanding of their doctrines. She knows at the end of the days when this earth is done and Jesus comes back for all his people, the final resurrection, when we all raise in Christ, those alive and those dead. She's thinking the end of days. Jesus is telling her something different. Watch this in verse 24 or verse 25, rather. Let's go to verse 24 first. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So that's her thinking, right? The last day. Jesus says something different. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. This is why the world is gathered here today. Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He looks at her right in the white of her eyes. Do you believe I am the resurrection? I am the life. No matter what's going on, I can resurrect it. And so in between this time, the sister goes and gets the sister because Jesus calls for her because she's not coming out. She's not having this Jesus stuff. And maybe you feel that way today. You're not having this Jesus stuff. Someone dragged you here because they promised you brunch or lunch. I don't really know the difference, but I know you're going to eat. Maybe someone made you feel bad. Maybe someone has you tuning in online right now, but you're not really having this Jesus stuff. And so they had to go and get Mary to come back to Jesus. And so we pick up now in verse 32. It says this, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, remember what she did. She anointed his feet. She wiped his feet with her hair like she had believed she was intimate with the Savior in her spiritual walk with him. But watch this. She fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Does that sound familiar to anybody? The sister's been talking. This is what their heart revealed. You were not here when I needed you the most, so why are you here now? What good does it do for a Resurrection Sunday service when I have all this hurt and all this pain and all this baggage in my life? What good does Resurrection Service at Legacy Church in 2024, what good is it going to do me today? I have so much pain and so much hurt and so much hang-ups. I've been used and abused. I've got more issues. I've got 99 problems. A great poet once said, and Resurrection Sunday ain't one. Anybody feeling what Mary's going through right now? I feel it. And it says that Jesus, in verse 33, was deeply moved in spirit, and it troubled him. He was deeply moved in spirit, and it troubled him. 
Verse 33, sometimes we'll mistake this. We'll emote our own feelings. Like the last time you were at a funeral, what you felt. Like Jesus is so moved. He's so sad that someone died. Like he's not God. So we miss this. So in the original language, when he's moved and troubled, the literal depiction is a war horse snorting and getting ready for battle. Jesus is empathetic. Jesus does care about the feeling. But in this moment, that's not the feeling. That's not what's to be conveyed. What's to be conveyed, he's frustrated. You ever been frustrated? You got kids. You ever been frustrated? He's frustrated. He taught them this lesson. They know his faithfulness. They know his ability. They know about his healings. They know that he is the resurrection. But watch this. We will lose our spiritual maturity for some natural occurrences. We will let natural things shipwreck us and shipwreck our faith. We will say things like, where are you, God? And God is saying, I was asking, I was thinking the same thing. Where are you? I haven't heard from you in prayer. I haven't heard from you at church. Where, are, where am I? Where are you? Jesus and God, they're in the same place. We're the ones that drift. We're the ones that drift. And so in this moment, he is frustrated that people around, and if you read the full story, people around him are saying, hey, isn't this the one that opened the blinded eye? Isn't this the one that did all these miracles? Couldn't he have known? Of course he knew about this situation. Of course he knew about your situation. Of course he's aware of your hurting and your suffering and your pain. Could it be that there's more happening behind the scenes? Could it be that looks are deceiving? Could it be? Let's keep reading. Let's go down to verse 38. It says this. Jesus, here it goes again, the same language, once more moved. It's a rebuking or a warning type of emotion. He came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And here's what he says. No no time for small talk at this point. He's getting right to it. Verse 39, he says, take away the stone. But the sisters, someone say the sisters. Sisters are back in action. But Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time, there's a bad odor. Anybody grow up with the King James? What does it say? He stinketh a bad odor, Lord, for he has been there in case you forgot when we called the carrier and we told you and you stayed for two more days. He's been there four days. She's not wrong. I did a little study because I got grossed out, but I did a little study this past week on a decaying body. And within four days, some real bad stuff is happening. I'm talking some some liquids are or coming from the body. I'm talking some smells. I'm talking rigor mortis. Like some really gross things are beginning to happen. She's not wrong. Naturally, she's wrong spiritually. And you're not wrong to feel the way you feel, disappointed, let down by God, let down by life, church hurt. You've seen people who profess to live for God, churches, pastors, leaders, people you grew up in the house with. They profess a lot. You're not wrong naturally, but we don't put our eyes on people. We put our eyes on God. That's why he sends Jesus, because no preacher, no teacher, no prophet, none of us has ever gotten it right. So he sends Jesus. But she doesn't know to take her eyes off the natural and put it on the spiritual. So her problem is she's putting her eyes on the situation and not the Savior. She's more concerned with the corpse than the Christ. And Jesus is going to have to turn her attention. Like he's going to have to turn your attention today. You've been too concerned with the situation. Today, you're going to be concerned with the Savior. Verse 40. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you? Is this not apparent? He's like, we've been through this. Did I not tell you to clean this room? Did I not tell you to turn these lights off? Money does not grow on trees. I become my parents. I don't even know how. I don't even know how. I say the same things. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? He's speaking to their moments of doubt, disappointment, and disbelief. You can be disappointed with God today. Just know he's going to speak to your disappointment. You can be upset. You can be angry. You cannot believe. Just know he'll meet you in the midst of it. If you found yourself on the floor this past year, you didn't even know he met you on the floor. If you found yourself crying more than you thought you would cry just a quarter into the year, he's counted every tear. Can I prove it to you? Let's keep reading. So they took away the stone. 
Then Jesus looked up and said, not to the sisters, Mary and Martha, not to the crowd that was doubting him. He said to his father, Father, I thank you. You have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this, I said this for the benefit of the people standing around here and the people who are going to be reading this Bible one day and the people in North Florida one day and the people listening online. I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe what? That you sent me. There's more going on behind the scenes of this story in your life that you can see. That's why looks can be deceiving. The Bible even says, ah, I should have had this verse on the screen. Have faith in what you can't see, not in what you can see. Verse 43, when he had said this, Jesus called out with a loud voice. My wife says I don't need a microphone because I'm loud anyway. Tomato, tomato, you know, there. But this voice that we're talking about, it's a different kind of voice. This is the voice that spoke during the feeding of the 5,000 to 5, 10, 15,000, and everybody could hear. This is the voice that sat on the shore in a boat, and his voice reverberated across the whole beach to the hundreds gathered. This is the voice that spoke on the temple steps with no PA system. This is the voice that in Genesis chapter 1 said, let there be, and there was. This is the voice that said, let there be light, and there was light. This is the voice that told the sun, you stay there, and the moon, you stay there. Read Genesis chapter 1 at your leisure. This is the voice he told the water and the oceans, you stay there, and it stayed. This same voice said, Lazarus, come out. That same voice, Genesis chapter 1 voice, said, Lazarus, come out, and the dead man came out. Have you ever asked yourself, why not just the stones rolled back? It's the only open tomb around here. Come out, Lazarus. Because when the voice of the resurrection calls for the resurrection, if he didn't say Lazarus, every dead thing would have came out. If he didn't say Lazarus, bones would have came together. Sinew would have formed. And it had been the walking dead, not the series, but the real thing. There were thousands of bodies in these, in these cemeteries, thousands of bones throughout the millennia. And if Jesus would have said, come out, it would have been a party, and a weird kind of party. It would have been the premature resurrection. So the king of the universe, the one who spoke the universe into existence, has to say, not the rest of you. Lazarus, come out. And when he says, Lazarus, come out, I can't make this stuff up. His hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. I don't know if our guy Lazarus is hobbling, if he's hopping. I don't know what. He's wrapped up tight, right? He's a mummy-looking mummy character. But he comes out, and Jesus says, it's kind of the microphone drop. Take the grave clothes off and let him go. All of you doubters, all of you Sh trying to shame me in the situation, if you would have been here. He says he won't need these clothes any longer. He won't need what was, what was on him, what was weighing him down any longer. He needed it for a season, and you are experiencing things that are weighing you down for a season, but there's going to come a moment where you won't need them any longer. And if you can trust in God right now, at some point in life, he's going to take those grave clothes off. Those trials will fall away. So now that you have context, I ask you the question, what is the resurrection? What is the resurrection? Why does it change your life? Why today can it become a paradigm shift for the rest of your days to reconcile your past, your present, and your future? I've got three things I want to leave you with. The resurrection is a person. The resurrection is prescribed. The resurrection is a personal revelation. And they're all present tense because it's what is happening right now in your life. The resurrection is a person. The resurrection was always a person before it was an occurrence. Whether Lazarus raised from the dead or not was inconsequential. Let me tell you why. Lazarus, he was going to die again. Didn't matter if he got up or not. He was going to die again. What 
the whole purpose and premise around this was them understanding the resurrection wasn't just an occurrence, it was the person of Jesus. Jesus reveals he's the resurrection first in word and then in deed. It's beautiful to see. It's not until they see him as the resurrection, they don't experience the resurrection. And if you want to see dead things rise in your life, you have to know him and have faith in him as the resurrection because he can heal and resurrect anything in your life. Past, present, and future. He can reverse the death process. He can reverse rigor mortis. And I studied about it, and it is gross. He can reverse it all because it's not just an occurrence. It's a person. Next, resurrection is prescribed. Someone say prescribed. What part of the resurrection do you think was a surprise to Jesus? Not a rhetorical question. What part of the resurrection was a surprise to Jesus? None of it. None of it. Let me introduce you to to type A Jesus. Any type A's with me out here? You knew what you were going to wear to Resurrection Sunday two weeks ago. Like, you were, you, were, you were on it. You were already there. Us type A's, we drive our families crazy on family vacation. Right? We're not here to relax and have fun. We're here to get things done. We never get to travel. We're spending a lot of money. You're going to wake up early. <laughs> our families hate us secretly. Secretly. Behind closed doors, they hate us. They talk about us. You know, if we were the first one to go to the family, they'd be okay with it. You know, they would grieve, but they'd be okay with it. They'd be able to relax on vacation and relax in the airport. I, I get how you girls feel about me. It's okay. Let me introduce you to type A Jesus. Jesus knew every part of the story. He was surprised by none of it. Jesus knew about the sickness and the pain Lazarus was going through. He knew about the doctor bills, the medical bills that I'm sure had to come as they were trying to medicate him and keep him alive. Jesus knew what was going to happen with the two-day delay. He knew about the four days in the grave, and he knew that he missed the funeral procession. All of the funerals took longer in this culture, but the procession to the tomb, he knew he missed that. He knew he missed the grave, the grief, the mourning. He knew he wasn't there for the funeral cost, whatever it cost to bring in the mourners and all the other things that were customary in this culture. He knew he missed all of it. What I'm trying to show you is this. It was prescribed so clearly by Jesus, and I don't know if you saw it. In verse 4, he said what? Do you remember? This won't end in what? Death. He said, I know what's coming. I know where this is going. Verse 41, what did he say? Father, I thank you. You hear me. And this ain't for me and you. This is for them. This is for all the groupies. It's for all the peanut gallery. Oh, the one who opened the blinded eyes. Could he not have been here? If you would have been here, my brother wouldn't. He said, this prayer is not even for me. For all them. For Mary and Martha, the sisters, for the onlookers, this was prescribed, premeditated, and purposeful. Your entire life that's got you to this point, into this building, or watching online, your entire life has been prescribed, premeditated, and purposeful. You're going to see it. Mary and Martha wanted healing, but God wanted a resurrection. And aren't you so glad you have a heavenly father who doesn't give you what you want, he gives you what you need. That's how much he loves you. Anybody who's had a good parent or a good mentor knows they don't give you what you want. If that's the case, my daughter would have McDonald's chicken nuggets every day of her life. She had some the other day. She's like, oh, I miss having this. I'm like, no, sweetheart, you're not having processed food all the time because I don't want to give her what she wants. I want to give her what she needs. And lastly, the resurrection is a personal revelation. Someone say personal revelation. This is what you walk out with. It is a personal revelation. Whenever your expectation doesn't line up with your situation, God wants you to lean on him for a personal revelation. I'm going to say it one more time. Tap your neighbor if they're tuned out or if they're sleeping, or if they're checking the scores. Because you guys know baseball is back. It's back. Whenever your expectations don't line up with your situation, God wants you to lean on him for a personal revelation. So I want you to take up every expectation you have right now. All the things going on in your life, internally, you're waiting on God for some things. Externally, you're waiting on God for some things. In your relationships, in your marriage, in your career, in your finances, in your mental health, in your emotional health, 
in your physical health. You name it. Just, just hold it all together. Everything you're believing God for, I want you to put it all together right now. Everything you're waiting on God for, if it does not line up right now with your expectation, it's because you need a personal revelation of God. See, this story allows us to relate in our current seasons of waiting. Someone say waiting. Every person in here, no matter how big, tall, skinny, not skinny, probably culturally appropriate, right? Skinny, not skinny. Um, educated, not educated. How much net worth or no net worth. Some of us are w- worth more dead than alive. No matter where you are on the spectrum, we are all the same that we are in a waiting season. My least favorite thing in a plan is a holding pattern. Like, what? Surely there's something else you can do here. We are all in a waiting season of some type. And many of us don't value our waiting seasons. We devalue our waiting seasons. Waiting on God. <laughs> waiting on God. Glad he came through for you. Yep. Oh, you're married? I just get invited to, to married, to weddings. <laughs> I don't really get, I don't, I'm not married. Oh, oh you, you, you guys are debt free? Oh, okay. I'm paying the minimum payment on my, my bills right now. Your kids got accepted where? Mine dropped out. Oh my gosh, your new, your new Tesla, your new whatever. Yeah, my car broke down yesterday. You know, like th- there are these, these waiting seasons that we are in. And when we hear of other people, we're hateful. Not publicly, but privately, like in our head, like must be nice to be that. Must be nice to have that husband. Cleans up around the house and does dishes and oh, brings flowers. It must be nice to have that kind of husband. Our waiting seasons, we devalue. So watch this, we waste our waiting seasons. See, the sisters and the gather, people gathering around, they were in a waiting season for what? Lazarus. You don't know what the rest of what's going on in their life. And I don't know what's going on in your life. You know what's going on in my life. But we're all in a waiting season. And while we wait, we can worship or we can waste. Someone say worship. Someone say waste. We can grow. Or we can not grow. We can get more mature, we can get more immature. We can draw closer to God, we can get further from God. We can be familiar with God, we can become really, really, really unfamiliar with God. I talk to people all the time, and the last time they talked to God was when something bad happened. Last time I talked to God was when this went down. This is what waiting season can do. You can allow it to draw you closer, or you can allow it to bring distance. See, oftentimes we waste waiting seasons. We don't value waiting seasons because we believe that a delay is a denial. Just because you're delayed in a waiting season doesn't mean God has denied you. Doesn't mean he's not going to come through. You just have to wait. You just have to wait. You just have to wait. And we hate that word. I hate that word. I've never been patient. Not a day in my life to this moment before you. I am not a patient person. To God, I guess we're kind of like the, the kid when you take off on the trip and you've been driving for five minutes. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know what I'm talking about. I become so frustrated with this. Whenever we go somewhere, I tell my daughters, look at the dashboard. <laughs> you see that time? You see those miles? Don't ask me again. It's right there. But every day we wake up, God, are we there yet? God, are you coming through? God, are you making a difference? God, are you healing God, are you pulling through? God, where's the opportunity? God, where's the promotion? God, where's the opportunity? God, where's the spouse? God, where's the Mr. Right or Mrs. Right? I've been settling for Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Right now. I need a Mr. Right. You know what I'm saying? Every day, God, are you there? God, are you there? Missing, he's speaking in the waiting seasons. This might be the biggest question you will ask yourself. I'm not joking. In 2024, you ready for it? For all of you type A note takers, I'm going to put it on the screen. You ready? What if the bigger breakthrough comes in the waiting process and not in what you were actually waiting on God for? What if? What if? Thank you. Thank you, the one. Thank you, the one. One one person got it. Come over here now so I can find one more. What if the bigger blessing, the bigger opportunity came in the midst of the waiting season and not when God gave you what you were waiting on. What if, what if that happened? Because in this story, Jesus said before he brought Lazarus back from the dead, you can look at it in your Bible or your app in verse 26, what did Jesus say? He said, do you believe I am the resurrection, Martha? He didn't even get to Lazarus. 
He said, but wait, 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 wait. You're in the waiting season? Do you believe? Are you willing to mature? Are you willing to trust me where you can't trace me? When it doesn't feel good, do you want to serve me? When you don't get the health and the wealth and the prosperity and all the stuff that the, the, the modern church talks about, well, I'm blessed because of this, I'm blessed because of this, do you believe I'm the resurrection? And then we see Lazarus. There's something to that there. There's a bigger breakthrough in what she learned in her waiting season than Lazarus being resurrected again. And if you can receive that, you can receive the overarching theme of this. The goal was Jesus coming late to reveal his love and his glory. That was why Jesus said, I'm staying here two more days. That is why he said that. Because he wants to reveal his love and his glory. Here's a big opportunity right now, whether you're new to the faith, don't believe yet, or you've been believing for a long time. Here's a big moment in, the, in this time together. Are you ready for this big moment? God mainly loves us by giving more of himself to us. The main way God loves, now he loves you and I other ways, right? Opportunity, finance, um, moments in life, bucket list things, um, health, well, like there's, there's a lot of things that God will do in our life, right? God mainly loves us by giving more of himself to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus mainly loves us by giving us more of Jesus, more of himself, more re revelation of the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen who? That's how he mainly loves us. We are loved by God and Jesus when we have more of him, when we feel his presence, when we draw close to him, we feel at peace, and we feel like we know him and he knows us. We feel like he sees us and we see him. That's how he mainly loves us. Please don't walk out of here today. Don't log off online today and measure the love God has for you by health, wealth, blessings, and comfort. If you measure God's love for you by any of those prosperity metrics, that means God hated John the Baptist. God hated the Apostle Paul. God hated Esther. God hated Naomi and Ruth. God hated Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego. God hated Joseph at the bottom of that cistern. God hated Job. God hated Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His love to them was never measured by blessings and opportunities. It was measured by what? Nearness. Closeness. God loved Jesus in that Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he? But it wasn't proven by a lack of pain and a lack of hardship. What was it proven by? Nearness. God's love is not revealed in sparing us of hardship, but showing more of him. That won't sell tickets. That won't make you visitors come back next week. We'll be here, same time, same channel. That won't make you come back next week. But that'll take you a lifetime. That'll right side some bad theology, some bad doctrine out there. My job is not to excite you and, and, and make you think something that's not true. My job is to give you the truth of God's word. And that you have a heavenly father that loves you so much. He's so madly in love with you. He thinks about you when you're not thinking about him. Your iPhone or whatever Samsung technology you found did not wake you up this morning. Goodness and mercies woke you up. But please, don't walk out of here measuring God's love by if you get the promotion or if you get the opportunity or if the girl says yes. Don't measure your love by the title in your position. Don't measure his love by your health. Don't measure your lo his love by your net worth. Measure his love by how much he's revealed himself to you. And it gets no greater than through the love of Jesus, through the revelation of Jesus. In this story that you and I just read, it's more loving to let a person die. It's more loving to let their relatives go through grief and pain and turmoil. It's more loving to let them suffer and have more hours of crying than sleeping. Do you remember your moments of suffering? Do you remember your moments of trauma? One of the hardest things I've ever had to do was bury my nephew this past year. If you have a nephew or a niece, you, you never think, that you bury them, you think they bury you. Don't tell me this is a good situation, God. His name was Pete. And as I'm, I was asked to do the funeral, 
My dad asked me, his, his grandson, he didn't want to do it, so I said, I'll do it for you, Pop. And as I'm doing this funeral, I watched all the people stroll into the funeral place. There was only standing, only standing room in this little place where we had the funeral. And what I saw is that everybody in that room would never hear the gospel unless he, he passed away. It was a tough room. It was a tough room. And what I saw, the people in that room had no basis, no connectivity to God, nor church. Everything that I was telling them about the way, the truth, and the life, about the resurrection was completely brand new. And I wish I could have saw it in the moment so I could, like, brag to you, but I didn't. I saw it as I was preparing this message. I was angry. I was sad. I was mad. My last conversation with him, I didn't know, was our last. Maybe I would have said some more things. Maybe I would have hugged him more. Maybe I would have told him how proud I was of him and, and our memories as kids and, and, and as him as a kid. Maybe I would have thought more into that space. But be careful what you call a bad experience. Be careful what you call a hardship. Because through Jesus' doctrine that he shares right here, nothing is a bad experience and nothing is a hardship when you look through the perspective and the lens of whatever draws me closer to God, I'm willing and I'm ready. Jesus said what? Not my will, but my Father's will. He said, whatever you have, Father, whatever draws me closer to you, I'm in. Because everything else is fleeting. If you've lived long enough, you know what I mean. If you've made enough money, you've had enough friends, you've done enough travel, you've had enough reputational things, you've accomplished enough goals and degrees, it's all fleeting. Ask Hollywood, ask entertainers, ask influencers, ask athletes. It's all fleeting. Go stand by the graves of the most influential and wealthy people. It's all fleeting. There's one thing. There's one thing in this life that we are promised. And that's more of him. <laughs> See, when you and I think about God's love, we think about John 3.16, don't we? What's John 3.16? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him, my daughter's in ballet, if you can't tell, I've got a few of her. First position, second, but I've got, I got a few moves. That whoever believes in him, I'm going to fall off the stage. If I have everlasting life, I know you would catch me, Miguel. I know you would catch me. But should never believe, but eternal life, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only God's son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I'll stop dancing. We think that's God loves. We don't necessarily think about John 11:5. He's on his deathbed, and you say we're not leaving two more days? That's not love. That's not love. It's more love than they ever could imagine. Because it was going to bring the sisters, it was going to be the rest of the people closer to God. It was going to reveal more of the Son and the Father. So that tells us whatever God allows is worth it. See, trauma can turn into testimony. Hardship, that can turn into something that, that allows you to strive and move forward in life. John 17, 3 tells us really what we're promised in this life. A lot of us have believed a false gospel and a prosperity gospel and all sorts of things that are out there and your favorite YouTube person and, you know, pray these three prayers and you're going to have it in a week and all that. You can do that if you want or you can read God's word. John 17, 3 says this. Now this, someone says eternal life. The only thing that lasts in this life and the next, the only thing that spends in this life and the next, here it is. This is all we're promised. That they know you, the only what? True. Let God be true and every man be a lie. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have set, period, point blank, full stop. The only thing we're promised in this life is knowing God through the person of Jesus. Everything else is a bonus. You and I might, well, why did I go through this? And why did this happen to me? And why this and why that? Why this abuse? Why this hurt? Why this pain? Why this bad luck? We might find out in this life or the next, but it doesn't really matter. I don't know if you wanted to hear that or not, but it doesn't really matter. We are promised to know him and his son, and that's it. And if we have that, we have all that we need. I love how John 14, 21 says it. It says, the one who loves me, this is Jesus, will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. He promises, here's your promise for your life. I'll show myself to you. 
yeah, God, but what about the house? And, and what about the, the, the spouse? And what about this? And what about that? He said, no, 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 you got your eyes on the wrong thing. You got your eyes on the wrong thing. I'm going to give myself to you. The King James says, I'm going to manifest myself to you. I wonder if when you walk out today, will he manifest himself to you? Would you be open? Would you be willing? And here's how we're going to close. The second tomb. The first tomb was Lazarus' tomb. The second tomb was Jesus' tomb. And as we get to this tomb, a lot has happened that you're probably aware of if you've seen the shows or you've been in church any amount of time. Jesus was crucified for saying that he was the son of God. No one took his life. The Bible says he laid his life down. He said, I could call a legion of angels right now, but how would scripture be fulfilled? And so Isaiah says he was so marred, he was so bruised, he was so beaten, he scarcely resembled a human being coming from the whipping post and being tortured, stripped naked and hung on a cross, Flex on a cross. I wonder those of us who wear the crosses understand really what that means. That is a sign of torture. It's an electric chair of sorts. He was flexing a cross for my sin and your sin. The only way that you and I get to this eternal father is through the person of Jesus. But the Bible says someone had to die for sin. And so Jesus laid his life down, humiliated, shamed, cursed in the worst way. Every sin that you and I would ever do, every sin in the, in the world, the worst sin, he became that sin. That's why you read, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because he becomes the sin. And as he becomes the sin, he's put in a borrowed tomb. And as he's put in that borrowed tomb, what do you know? They allow natural circumstances to override the spiritual circumstances. So everyone's hiding. No one believes that he's resurrected. He told them, and it happened just as he said. They're all hiding out, except for the women. Someone say the women. Women get a real hard rap in our world, but in the Bible, it's straightforward. The women come out. Let me show you. John chapter 20, you got to go a few chapters to the right in your Bible. Early on Sunday morning, because the men are still sleeping, early on Sunday morning while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, a different Mary, not, not one of the sisters, she's part of his ministry, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone had already, already been rolled away from the entrance. And then it says in verse 11, she stood outside the tomb crying. Why is she crying? Because she forgot resurrection is not an occurrence. It's a person. And it's Jesus. She was swimming to the shore and she gave up. She lost her way. The, the, the waves of life and, and the currents and, and the fog and she lost her way. And as she loses her way, she's just crying and grieving. And like only Jesus can, he shows up in the midst of their worst moment. And in verse 16, in his voice, the voice of Genesis 1 and John 11, verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, in the tone that she would recognize. And she turns toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni. And so today, as we close, I just want you to keep swimming toward that shore. I want to help you get past the cold waters of life. I want to help you get past the currents. I want to help you get past the fog. You don't have to know where God is leading, what he is doing. You don't have to reconcile and understand everything you're experiencing, your emotions, your feelings, your traumas, your hurt. Just keep swimming. Just keep going towards this Messiah, towards this Savior. And you might say, well, I don't have the strength. I'm glad because the Bible says when you come to an end of yourself, that's where he comes in. And that's where you need the resurrection. So somebody today, it's not that you're interested in the resurrection. You need the resurrection. You can't go any further. There's nothing left to do or to try. Most of us, we've tried everything under the sun like Solomon, and it hasn't fulfilled us. The resurrection is it. And so now that you know the resurrection is a person, the resurrection is prescribed, and the resurrection is a revelation, it is time for your revelation. You leave different. You can't leave the same. You leave different. You were just exposed not to the occurrence but to the person. So I don't know what that means for you next week in church or not. You've got to sort that out in your heart. I don't know what that means for you the rest of the year. You've got three quarters left of the year. What does that mean? It's got to be different. You can't talk and act and do the same things before you encounter this resurrection. 
It's got to be different. People should notice a difference. You should think and talk and walk and, and live differently because now you have a strength that comes from someone else named Jesus. And so in this moment, we're done. Service is over. But there are some in this building, there's some online, that your relationship with Jesus is not where it needs to be. And I'm not going to define that. I'm going to let you define that. We all have a different idea. But what I know is this. Many of us grew up in church. And some of us grew out of church. Walked away from God. Someone invited you here today. Someone prayed you here today, and you're here. Can I tell you, if you prayed to receive Jesus when you were younger, in another season of your life, but you walked away, he's what's called a good father. And a good father welcomes his children back whenever they're ready to come home. He wants to welcome you home. And there's another set of you, you've never prayed a prayer to receive Jesus into your life. You don't know the resurrection power. You may be skeptical. You've heard a lot, you've seen a lot, but most of us, we're bad examples. I confess that. But I want you to take your eyes off of people and eyes off of examples and put your eyes on the one who laid his life down for you the one who is the resurrection. And so if you will bow your heads with me, I'm going to ask you in this moment, in the building and online, if you are far from Jesus Christ, would you please, with all sincerity, make the decision today to surrender your life to Jesus? Our church, we're going to pray with those, and there's two, two people in this room I'm praying for right now, those who are far from Jesus but have prayed. And so you need to rededicate your life today. And the others, you've never prayed a prayer. We are welcoming you to the family of God. That when you die, you will spend eternity with the resurrection in the resurrection. And so church, let's pray with those who are praying this prayer. Lord God, I believe in you. I repent of my sins and welcome Jesus into my life. Lord, I surrender the rest of my days to you. Give me a hunger for your word and for discipleship. Teach me to walk in repentance and humility. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Why don't you put your hands together for all those who prayed that prayer.